This is something that many people explore, but we are going to explore it in a different way, I believe. And we are going to be faithful to the text, and therefore let me get what I think is the basic issue. All right? And Good. There is a discussion about justice and injustice in the Republic, and the participants in the Republic get a little bit upset with Socrates because they say, look here, every time the issue of justice and injustice is discussed, people always confound it with the rewards and benefits that follow or the punishments and the exiles that follow for the other. But no one ever talks about justice just in terms of what it is in itself. No one talks about injustice, what it is in itself. Therefore, they challenge Socrates to consider two people. One, someone who is really masterful in being unjust. This person is perfectly unjust, so much so that he's able to fool everyone, even his wife. And, as a consequence, he can do injustice perfectly. That means he's an expert craftsman in his pursuit of injustice. He knows what's possible and he knows what's impossible, therefore he always stays within the possible. Whenever he slips, he can recover, and no one is able to discern his injustice. He gains public office, he marries his family into the highest families of the land, he enters into partnerships and contracts. He always succeeds, and he always succeeds in such a way that he always ends up with a greater share because he is so careful in his injustice. Therefore, he reaches the high point in society, and he can benefit friends, and he can hurt his enemies. With the sufficient money and prestige, he sacrifices to the gods, and he has it from the best priests that they have a banquet for him when he dies because it's likely then that they too were fooled and therefore he lives his life as perfect injustice. Now, what they say to Socrates is now, think of the next man. He, on the contrary, is perfectly just. He is perfectly just, but he appears to everyone as living a life of injustice. He does no wrong, never has done anything wrong. But he has the greatest reputation for injustice. And therefore he gets absolutely no rewards, he gets no benefits, gets no honors. As a matter of fact, in the end of his life, they catch him and he's scourged, racked, chained, his eyes are burnt out, he suffers every misery, and finally he's set up on a pole. They say to Socrates, now Socrates, what we want you to do is to demonstrate to us rationally, no appeal to emotion, no rhetoric of any kind, prove to us that it's better to be this man than this man. And you must do it only under one, one set of terms. You have to show what each is, justice and injustice, and the benefit each has on the soul of the man who has it. It must reflect back on the impact that justice and injustice has on the soul. And therefore they say, let's strip everything apart from this. And therefore this man who is naked appears naked because there is nothing therefore that he can be associated with that is unjust. And this man has all of the garments of appearing just, so he appears just, but he's unjust. He is just, but he appears unjust. And therefore, the great challenge in the Republic then is, what is the nature of justice and justice? What each is and the benefit of each. Socrates accepts the challenge and they go and they, re they repeat it a couple of times. The challenge, what, what each is, must be explored in itself by its own power, since each has a power, and it must be seen in the soul, and it must be hidden from the gods and men. We must show justice is the greatest good and injustice the worst evil, and that must be demonstrated in terms of the impact each has on the soul of the man who possesses it. That's the challenge. 
Therefore, Socrates then sets up an analogy. Now, everything follows from this analogy. This is the central, the central piece of the Republic. Socrates says, look, it's going to be very difficult to explore justice and injustice in the, in the soul of man. What we need to do is see it written large. We have to see it in large, bold letters, as it were. Just as we studied letters as a child, he says. At first, you don't start with little letters. Your teacher shows them large and bold, and then you gain insight into them. You can then see them both in the large and the small. So he says, therefore, what we're going to do is see justice and injustice in the state, because the state is the soul written large. And therefore, he comes up with this beautiful analogy. As the soul is to its parts, experiencing both justice and injustice, so too the city-state is to its parts, experiencing both justice and injustice. And therefore, Socrates says, let us then build a state. I will build a state. The parts of the state are going to come out to be exactly as the parts of the soul. Therefore, everything he says about the state will have its corresponding impact on the soul. Therefore, he's going to create a state. He's going to design one. It's called the city-state. Now, at first, he creates an ideal state. And then it's criticized. And he criticizes it himself. He says, oh, he says, that's right. We don't want a true and just state. We want one in high fever. We want a sick state. We want one in high fever. Because we want to see both justice and injustice. Therefore, we need a state that is not ideal, but we have to build a state that is ideal and then disintegrates into an unjust state. In that way, we'll be able to see how the soul of man comes into existence, pursuing justice, and how man then drops down into injustice. And when we do that, then we'll take a look at the effect or the benefit each has on the soul of man and see what benefits and honors can be said to accompany each. So therefore, he builds a steady state and everything he says about it, we must transfer to the soul of man. Every statement here must have its correspondence here. Do you take questions? Pardon? Do you take questions during the lecture? Oh, sure, just so long as they're... Just man that seems injust. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, go ahead with it. You can do it. Yeah, for, the, for this dialogue, you need to. Yeah. You need to? To play the game. Okay. Yeah, to play the game. You have to. Well, who made up these, these descriptions? Of all of this is Socrates. This all comes from the Republic. Yeah. Okay. Therefore, what do we need to do? Well, what we need to do through this analysis is to know the true nature of the soul. Now, how can you really discover the true nature of the soul? Now, what I'm going to be doing now is I'm now going to the end of this search in order to explore a few issues so we can then go into the arts and the studies of the philosopher king. What we really need to do is to know the true nature of the soul. If we know the true nature of the soul, then we can see how it gains its excellence and how it loses it. So, in order to know the true nature of the soul, it must be free of the body. All right? It must be considered in the light of reason. And when the soul is purified, then it's seen, in terms of what Plato and where he's going, will be seen to be the most beautiful thing or more beautiful than anything else. It's only then that we can see clearly the distinction between justice and injustice. This is how he concludes his book. This is how he concludes the whole dialogue. So our whole goal then is to know the nature of the true nature of the soul. In what way does he mean it must be free of the body? In what way must be considered in the light of reason? In what way must it be purified? In what way can he say it's beautiful? And on the basis of that, it looks like we're then able to make a perception to see the nature of justice and injustice and see the distinction between them.
One more piece. Now, what happens when the soul is purified? When the soul is purified, the soul's love of wisdom is saying, I need a, this won't work as a marker. Okay. When the soul is purified, the soul's love of wisdom is seen. And when one sees, sees as, right? and one sees as a consequence, it is akin to the divine and to the immortal. And then it knows eternal being. Then, one, two, three, then, just like before, then we can see whether the soul's nature is manifold, single in its simplicity, and then we'll discover the truths about it. Now, how is he going to then tell us how wisdom is grasped, how you can see that it's akin to the divine, why he says it's immortal and knows eternal being? Those are the arts we're going to explore. All right, that's our goal. That's where we're going. It's right here. To achieve these goals, we need the arts. And then we'll see that the soul is akin to the divine. That's right. Seeing is the this is the yeah. This is the key part. We're going to go back to it. All right. Then you'll be able to see whether the soul's nature is manifold or single, one or many, and in its simplicity, then it can grasp the nature of truth about it. So we need to know then these three things. How do you get it? Now we're starting the arts. These are the studies of the philosopher king. First, he says that the ascension to reality, ultimate reality, is true philosophy. And the real goal is to see how we can be led upwards to the light, in this beautiful example here, as some are fabled to have ascended from Hades to heaven. Now, what kind of a journey is that, the ascension to true reality? It's a conversion. It's a conversion that turns the soul around from the world of becoming to the world of being. Now, we're going to say quite a bit about this world, this word being, but I want to wait for a few minutes so we can get into it a little more before I do that. All right. Okay, that's our goal. What is it? We must be led upward, all right, to the light, as some are fabled to have ascended from Hades to heaven itself. What is it? It's a conversion, turning the soul around. Now, this is what is normally called the arts. Arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, harmony, their kinship and dialectic. Now, I'm going to ask you to do something with me. <clears throat> We're going to look at each one of these, and when we do it, I'm going to ask you whether or not the description is, that is given defines in any way that you're familiar with these subjects. Let me do you. As we go through this, I'm going to ask you whether the description that Plato gives for each one of these subjects is to be taken literally, and therefore he really means arithmetic, or whether he means it to be taken analogically, since the whole thing is an analogy. You have to determine this with me as we pursue it. If you pursue it and see that it is not literal, but analogical, that's the double meaning, and that's where we're going. All right? Now, this is the last time you'll see these names. Now, um, I'd like to ask you something uh, for a couple of minutes. Um,
Would you agree that if I have a series of things called numbers, whether you'll go along with me, and I'm going to write their symbol, there can be other ways to symbolize it. They have a name. Each one of these is rather curious. And let me see if I can get to the curiosity. Would you agree that what we mean by each of these, when we call them each, what we mean, do we not, that there is a certain amount in each of these. And when we talk about them, we take it as a unity, don't we? So if I say two, you know I mean one, two, that has two of these, and each of these is exactly the same, equal, always, never deviating, and there must be some way in keeping them together. Because we don't mean by two that unity, do we? It must be, therefore, determined that that unity keeps their, its particular elements together. Now, if I look at this chair, would you agree, right? I'm looking at it as a unity, but it has a number of parts which can be easily identified. So therefore it's a, as a unity, it has, it too has its parts, but it's not its parts. It's only when that unity persists that we talk about it as a chair because you take the parts apart, you lost the chair. It's only the unity that gives us the thing. In the same way, a tree, right? It's a tree, but it's made up of all of these elements. The elements can be separated, and it's no longer a tree. It's not the, the thing is not the elements. The thing must be the unity of its elements that transforms it into one tree. So would you not agree everything in this room that you can distinguish is a one? But on the other hand, it's a many. Agree? It's a one and it's a many. Simultaneously, is it not? We can talk about it one way or the other, can we not? But each of the parts, each of the parts is nothing other than a one. So all you're seeing is one. Wherever you look. Is that true? Don't mislead me, especially the people in the first row. So what, the only thing you're ever seeing is one. If you see a man, man, woman, right? You don't see the parts. You see the parts together into unity. The unity transforms the parts into an entity. But yet, on the other hand, you can distinguish the parts. You can call them different names. But when you have all the parts, you don't have the person until you have the unity, like a watch. If you have all the parts, that doesn't make a watch. All of the parts have to come together in some special unity. And when you have that special unity functioning somewhere towards a goal, keeping time, then you can call it a watch. Would you agree with that? Otherwise, it's not. Not yet. So therefore, when all of this comes together as a unity and has a direction, a function, then we can say it what it is, what it is. Well, now, wait a minute. Look here. I'd like to know in what class does number and the one belong? Now, look, look, look here. See, like, 
Should we put number one in the class of number? Is one a number? Well, let me raise it another way. Would you agree that when you're talking about numbers, there must be something that is used, theoretically at least, that can measure each one of these? Because you wouldn't want one of these that is twice as big as the other, or valued more than just one. <coughs> Therefore, any number, whatever it is, is presupposes that there must be a measure for each so that you're wanting. One, 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 you're wanting. And when you stop wanting, you have a number. Wherever you stop, that's your number. <laughs> but all you're doing is wanting. Now wait a minute, look here. Is the measure, is the measure of something ever used? If there's a gold standard somewhere, or if there's a measure of a foot, if there's a standard, would anyone want to use it? Why not? Why? It would be gone. It might, it might be varied in its use. And if it varies in its use, it will no longer be what it was before, and it can no longer be a measure. Ah, so then wait a minute, if that's true, one is not a number. It's the measure of number. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Well, then look here. Does number belong in the class of one, or is one in the class of number? Go ahead, miss. Look, I need an answer. Well, which whether you put it in either or neither or neither or nor, all right? What is this thing you're calling one? What is number and the one below? Yeah. Well, what is the one? Just as it is in itself. What would you say? I mean, would you agree the whole universe is one? God is one. Yeah. Everything is one. Wait a minute. Is there a one which includes everything? Is there an everything? One everything? Yeah. A totality? Is there one totality? Everything that is? Everything that was? Everything will be? Yeah. Well, then the idea of one is total and inclusive. But what is it? Since we know it can be utilized everywhere in the same way, and it never varies. It's one and many at the same time. Well, the way we're How can it be one and many at the same time? But in the way we're talking about it, it sounds like it's a unity. But look here. If it's one and many at the same time, didn't you agree that when the parts get together, they're fused and they become, it becomes a unity? What happens to its parts? Do the parts still function separately? Or are they unitized in some way and the thing becomes a one? Yeah. Yeah. Ah, well then what's the one? Since that's all you ever see and experience, what is it? After all, the nature of the one in itself. Okay. Plato takes this, you see, and he raises this point. The one that he postulates, each unity is equal to every other as a unity. Would you agree? One is equal to one. Pardon? One is equal to one. And all of these, all of these, and the unities, as unities, they're all equal. In that sense, that what you mean by each is a unity. And it unitizes the thing and it becomes a one. Without the slightest difference. And once it's unified, it no longer talk, you can no longer talk about it as its parts separate. Therefore, it admits of no division into parts. Once it's a unitary thing. The entire universe is one, as a unitized thing. Now, what would, the, what would the speculation on this question do to you if you decided to take it? Would you not then be saying about everything, the statue there, the chair there, the window here, every person in the room, what is, each person is a one. What is, after all, the nature of the one? How did the one, how, what kind of universe are we living in such that all you encounter is one? Is it such that we can say anything besides one, 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 
Well, I imagine you don't want to be redundant, and therefore all you'd say is one. <laughs> this is what he says now, all right? The effect of holding on to this question has this effect. It converts the soul to the knowledge of being. Remember, I said this is where we're going to keep going back to. Hold, yes, keeping that question. He says, you know what's wrong with the study of arithmetic? No one makes the right use of it. This is the right use of it. By the way, does it look like we're doing arithmetic? This is the way he is describing arithmetic in the Republic, what I'm doing. The soul, therefore, is compelled to contemplate being through such a pursuit. Because would you agree, whatever you call one, whatever you call one, has some, some kind of existence. Would you agree with that? Whatever you call what anything, you make a distinction about anything. You are talking about something, and you talk about it in respect to it being one, then you're not concerning itself with any other thing else, not its function, not its parts, not anything else, but the fact that it is one. Is there some curious connection then between this idea, the one, and being? Yes, and that's where we're going. Now, all of everything I'm doing tonight comes out of Plato. None of this is mine. Every quote on this sheet comes out of Plato comes right out of the section on the nature of the studies and the arts. Now, let me give you another study, all right? What we need to do is that we have to consider if whatever study we're doing facilitates the apprehension of the idea of the good. That's what we have to do. Now, what's this word? <clears throat> the ultimate term in Plato is called the good. The good is nothing other than that which all men seek. Whatever they seek, whatever you and I seek, we only seek it because we see it as good. When they only want to hold it, we only want to deal with it, so insofar as we think it's good for us and it benefits us. Once we have the slightest apprehension that it's bad for us and will bring us harm, we'll drop it. Therefore, the ultimate thing which we all seek is the nature of the good itself. Not any particular good, but an ultimate good. Now. To talk about the idea of the good <clears throat> in Plato, the word idea is Greek. And literally, that's a Greek word. Literally, it means to behold. That's what it really means, to behold. So therefore, the idea of the good <clears throat> is an expression that's reserved for when you want to talk about beholding the nature of the good. Not the good itself, but when you want to behold the nature of the good. Now, when you talk about the idea of the good, or beholding the idea of the good, that is nothing other than the word being. That's another word for it. That's another word for it. The idea of the good is to behold the good, and when you behold the good, <coughs> when you behold the good, it is experienced as the most brilliant light of being. That's what it's called. The, the, good, the idea of the good is called the most brilliant light of being. Being, therefore, is encountered as a experience of luminosity, of radiance, and that's one of the, of course, very high states all mystics seek and desire to experience. Some people get it spontaneously. Right? Therefore, going back, what's the idea of the good? To behold the good. If you behold the good, what do you have? An experience of the most brilliant light of being. That's called luminosity, divine radiance, <clears throat> and that's an ultimate experience, peak experience. Therefore, you know what we have to do? We have to consider whatever study we're going to be engaged in, we want to see if it facilitates the apprehension of that experience. That's our goal. Now, if it does so, we're going to study it. If not, not. Why? 
because we want to find a way in which we can dwell in the most blessed part of reality. When this is experienced, it is experienced as the most blessed part of reality. It is experienced as bliss, <clears throat> joy, wonder, delight. What's it like? Divine luminosity and radiance. Therefore, this study, what we're after, we're only interested in it for one purpose, so that we can turn the soul around. Why? So that we can dwell there in the most blessed part of reality, and that is to contemplate being. There's a new word we're sneaking in called essence. Just as I held back from the word being, I'm going to deal with that word later. All right. Now look here. What we're talking about, obviously, is not geometry. Would you agree? Is that right? I mean, <laughs> that's the way he defines geometry. Every quote here is from Plato. And therefore he says, this way of talking is in direct contradiction with the language employed by its adepts, its geometrical teachers. See, It's in direct contradiction to it. What does he mean, therefore, by geometry? It is the knowledge of what eternally exists. What's its goal? It must compel the soul to contemplate, same word, essence, <clears throat> and to the degree that it does that, it is suitable for one of our studies. If we use it to contemplate anything that comes into being, apart from it comes into, into existence, it's not. That's all he says about geometry. Does it look like geometry? If you were teaching a course in geometry, isn't this the way you teach it? <coughs> Strange, is it not? Now, wait a minute. We're gonna, it's going to get worse. <clears throat> he then talks about another study. And all I'm doing is taking the key quotes from each one of these sections, put them on the sheets, let you see them. Now, one of the goals of this strange study of geometry I need to use right now, he says, is that in the study of arithmetic, we must learn to do one thing to distinguish between one, two, and three. I mean, what's so difficult about it, distinguishing between one, two, and three? Now, what's interesting about Plato <clears throat> is that the effort you go through to understand it is itself, is itself the very process of exercising the understanding. His goal is to awaken the understanding because understanding in this way prepares you for this experience. That's the whole goal. What is it again? The book itself is designed in such a way that when you focus on it and put your mind to mastering it, the very steps you're going to go through to master it is going to be the exercise of the understanding, which is the very faculty and the very thing he insists is the central purpose of his philosophy. Why? because it can compare, it prepares the soul for a vision. Now, that's why I'm going back to this. One, two, and three. Every time Plato has a problem in any dialogue, especially the Republic, you can turn it into the Republic and look for its solution in terms of the Republic itself as an example within the book itself. Clever? So therefore, if he says, look here, we must discover the, this distinction between one, two, and three, you and I are going to say, well, that's obvious. Unless he himself has some trouble distinguishing one, two, and three. If he does, would we not want to know what kind of problem emerges when he has trouble distinguishing one, two, and three right in the Republic? Because if he says it's essential to understand the distinction between one, two, and three, and he goofs himself, and can't count one, two, and three, would we not want to study that and see what he means? Mm -hmm. That's right. How he resolves it. How he resolves it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Next, here we go. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not going to tell you what study this is. But the way he starts, the way he starts is this. He says, 
after geometry, we must study astronomy. And they go on talking about astronomy for a few minutes, and then Socrates says, oh, I think I made a mistake. I made a mistake. Astronomy doesn't follow geometry. I have to go back and correct myself. I wasn't <coughs> making a distinction that I should have made. One, two, three. Therefore, what does this allow us? One, two, three. That, that means these studies just don't appear in any order, because he wouldn't have made a mistake if the order doesn't matter. If it does matter in what order they're taking, to distinguish between one, two, and three is the notion that you have to approach these studies hierarchically and put one higher than the other. If that weren't the case, he would never have admitted he made a mistake. There'd be no point in making a mistake or admitting he made a mistake. Therefore, by correcting it, he tells us the significance of ordering these in a hierarchical way. Oh, that's an interesting sidelight. Okay. There's a charmed art he has. Now, let me look at this. They're very interesting, charmed art. He said, you know, if we can only get this art to be supervised by the city, oh, we said everything would change. But right now, there's no honor for this study, even though it's a charmed art. But if we could get a supervisor, and if we could get it honored, and if the advice of this art were taken, then the whole society would change in a very significant way. But right now, there's no honor given to it because it's seen as too difficult. You need a teacher or a director. And right now, the seekers are too arrogant to submit to the discipline required. Biggest problem in bringing out this charmed art is that the people are ignorant of the reasons for its pursuit. And so long as they're ignorant of the reasons for its pursuit, they're never going to study it. He said, therefore, we must talk about the nature of this charmed art. Ah, left out a letter. Which one? Maybe. Ah, I got them all there. Okay. All right. What does that mean then, if we have them all? What kind of a study is it? Come on. Continuous? Takes a great deal of effort. Great deal of effort. All right. Continuity. Continuity, right? Continuous. Endurance. Endurance. Order, Order, right? And that will be necessary if you want to go through an investigation to bring out the truth of what you're studying. Said, this is solid geometry. Doesn't it look like it? <laughs> No way, does it? You see, it's analogical. He's taking each one of these analogically. Now, there is a place in the Republic, and I want to telegraph it ahead. All right? Later in the dialogue in Book 8, Book 9, <clears throat> and a section of 10, he talks about these figures that we were talking about before, <clears throat> which is the just man and the unjust man, and the kinds of lives they lead. And he talks about them in terms of plain figures. And then he talks about them, right, when you begin to study them and see those figures, those people in depth, solid geometry, when you see those people in depth and can pursue them and to see the effect that justice and justice has on the soul, he said that's when you begin to study them in depth, these plain figures. And they're in motion. And how, how they are functioning. Pardon me? No, not yet. All right. So now I can get these sections for you so that therefore this language of solid geometry really applies to people's particular characters as they're proceeding through this dialogue and how they're compared and studied. So enough of that. This is called solid geometry. No, we have another one yet. Now look here. What we need to study now 
is the movements, it's the movements of real speed and real slowness. In what? This, would you agree, you're going to have to decipher because it doesn't make any sense. And that's why you know you're right on and you're understanding. You always preserve what you don't understand in Plato. You hang on to it and you wait for it to be clarified by the dialogue itself. So what we have to look for now is what he means by a true number and see if there's any description of any kind of speed or slowness attached to true number and how he uses the term true number, don't we? But that's not enough. Remember what we did before we talked about plain figures as characters? Now look what he's saying. In this study of mov movements, you must see it not only in true numbers, but in all true figures, both in relation to one another and as vehicles of the things they carry and contain. Now, when we get into these arts, especially in the dialectic, he breaks it up into sections. The sections are interspersed with sections from the allegory of the cave. Through this entire thing, when he gets into the dialectic, he's going to go back into the allegory of the cave, especially the part dealing with the upper world, which is seldom dealt with, but that's the heart of the study, not the allegory of the cave part, the allegory of the upper world. This is where all of these things are going to be discussed. That's what he does. But let's just stay with the language at this point. All right. And he says, you know what? It is absurd to think that I'm dealing with the sky and the heavens. Notice what he's doing. Because our goal, he says, we must find not the truth of things by looking upward in the heavens, we must find the truth with regard to equals, doubles, or any other ratio. You see, he's moved from numbers to ratios now. Numbers to ratios. Why does he deal with numbers and ratios? Because when you're studying ratios and you're lining them up with precision, that's the foundation for analogy, meaningful analogies. All right. He says, you know what, this study of astronomy, he said, you know what it is? We must reach a certain level. And the level we have to reach is the level of problems. As in the study of geometry. So whatever we were doing in geometry, that's the way you're going to do it when you're studying astronomy. Therefore, you have to know what's going on in geometry, have to grasp that because you're going to do something very slow. Hey, the same way you're going to carry it on now in this curious thing called astronomy. That's only if we have one goal in mind. And that goal we have in mind is that's only if we are to convert to right use the natural indwelling intelligence in the soul of man. That's what it's for. That whole purpose is to do that awaken the intelligence in the soul of man, turn it around, so therefore you can contemplate pure essence. That's where it's going. That's his goal. That's called astronomy. Does it look like astronomy? Wow. Now, if astronomy is following the model of geometry, do you have an idea what harmony may follow? This method corresponds to that of astronomy. And he says what you have to do is ascend to generalized problems. What kinds of problems? Again, which numbers are concordant and which are not? Back with what? Numbers, ratios, plain figures. We're in no way talking about anything that looks like harmony, are we? This is harmony. Now, he has a special use of the word concordant. If you had a TLG, access to TLG or Plato's uh, index, you could look that word up in the Greek and you could find every place it uses and you'll see why he uses it. Because he's taking it metaphorically. 
He says, this study has only one goal. Only one goal. It's useful for the investigation of the beautiful and the good. No longer the idea of the good, but the ultimate. Now, beauty in relationship to the good, this beauty, the most brilliant light of being, is obviously the most beautiful thing that anyone can possibly imagine because it violates all restrictions. It's a total experience of pure beauty. It is said to, it is said to stand in this relationship. The ultimate is the good. The vestibule around the good is pure beauty. Radiant, shining, blissful. That's called being. Idea of the good. Because if you behold it, that's what you'll encounter. Therefore, this is useful for the investigation of the beautiful and the good. That's what its purpose. That's its purpose. Now, none of these arts should be studied for any other purpose but one. And once that purpose is achieved, he drops it from consideration. And he doesn't pursue it any further. He said, these arts and studies goes just far enough, right? Goes just far enough to bring out their community and kinship with one another and to infer their, their affinities. In this talk, are you beginning to see the kinship between them? Mm -hmm. Right. The same terms come up in different ways? Yes, yes. If so, you're beginning to see right now the need to study this in a certain way. Because you have to bring out the community and kinship of these one to the other, and then sit back and infer their affinities one with the other. Once that's done, and it's only after that's done, can we go on to the real study, the real fun. Two parts, the prelude and the melody. The dialectic is broken up into two parts. One he calls the prelude, and the other calls the melody. He says dialectic is to be able to give an exact account of opinions and, and discussions. Then he introduces the allegory. Then he makes the second point. And he says, then you have to find the person, the individual, the dialectician, has to find his way to the essence of each. Each what? Hold that, hold that, all right? Because we have to go ahead to understand this. So just hold on to that for a moment. Until he approaches by the logos, by the word, by the logos, by pure reason itself, the very nature of the good in itself. Then he gives another reference back to the cave and the upper world allegory. All right, now, there is something interesting about that stuff, that radiance, luminosity, being. Because it is, in the truest sense, nothing dead, not like this. It is vitality itself. It's overflowing with vitality. It has a curious property, most curious of all, perhaps, that when encountered, it's like mind itself in its highest sense. When Plato talks about that, he calls it intelligence. And what you're encountering that has this vitality and this intelligence, which you can see immediately is akin to your own mind and mind itself, that you're encountering the very nature of reality or being. The word reality and being in this work are similar. Pardon me, essentially the same. Now, I want to add this now. This is capable of being absorbed into deeper, more profoundly, because it has its own reflective capacity. Hey, if you're lucky enough to get there, 
right? It has its own reflective capacity that you can go with it and penetrate it more deeply and more profoundly. That means it has the capacity to bring you along, turn you around into the very nature of reality. That expression in Greek is ousia. That's one word, ousia. And our translators translate it with the word essence. So, what is it? You have to find, the dialectician must find his way to the essence of each, what? We're going to hold that. But whatever it's going to be, it must be that which has the capacity to turn upon itself and bring you to a higher level of existence. For that's the nature of usia, or essence. All right. What's this? The prelude. Now we have to go to the higher part of the dialectic. which is called the melody of the dialectic. Now, the melody of the dialectic, he starts off by saying, it's only, you can only reach this ultimate goal through the power of dialectic. It has a power. Because it's only through that power that this can be revealed. What can be revealed? The nature of the good in itself. How do you do it? How must dialectic proceed? It proceeds systematically in all cases to determine what each really is. Each what? You're still asking, are you not? That's good. We haven't opened it up yet. All right? How do you proceed? In this highest part of the melody, it's a kind of reasoning that challenges the very hypotheses that underlie the system of exploration. And you have to do away with each one as you proceed until you reach up to the first principle of everything, of all, and there you find confirmation there. That's an insight into the nature of the good or the one itself. What is it capable of doing? It draws the soul, draws the soul up. Now, what do you have to do? He has a beautiful quote. He's, here it is. The dialectician must give an exact account of each. One must, the dialectician must be able to grasp the essence of each and of the good and of the good, examining everything by essence. What are these things? These are the four key ideas in book six and in book seven. Those are the cognitive functions of the soul the way in which the soul knows, experiences, and comes into touch with ultimate reality. You can have an image of it. Draw a picture of it. You can have certain beliefs about it. You can reach an understanding of it. You can know it. Therefore, if you're going to be the dialectician, your goal must be systematically, in each case where these four terms are being used, to determine what each really is in itself. What else must you do? You must give an exact account of each, and by the use of this idea of essence, because you have to reach the essence of each, that means you have to take a look at this in such a way to see that this has potentially the power Belief has the power of. Understanding has the power of. That's the goal. Transforming power. Each has it because all cognitive functions are merely different ways of functioning of essence or usia, the capacity to reflect upon itself and turn the mind upon itself. That's the goal. That's the dialectic. Right. And what are we using? We're now going to go through here one more step. He then puts this into a hierarchy. Remember, we needed the hierarchy before. And he says, what you must do, not only is to give an exact count of each of these, but then you must relate this to opinion. 
You have to relate this, these two, to the intelligible. You have to see that this realm of belief and what we now call opinion is really dominated by visualities, the visual world, the visible world. And therefore, the king over the visible world is the sun. As that which rules over understanding and knowing is the intelligible world, and what rules over it is the nature of the good. Now he says, we must now work with this and see and transform it in all the ways in which it can be represented. And he turns to Glaucon and he says, we keep, well, we're not going to do it now. And Glaucon, his colleague in the dialogue, says, well, you know, I'd like to do it. And he says, well, I, 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 I'm not going to be able to do it for him. I don't think he'll be able to follow. And therefore he gives him, as it were, an assignment, which is very similar to the assignment he gives him at the end of book six, which is to work out the implications of the divided line. This is called the divided line. The divided line is this, where you take a line and break it up into greater and lesser, and the same ratio is reproduced again. And here you put knowing, here you put understanding, here you put belief and image thinking. Same thing here. And therefore, the whole goal of this game is that now, once you understand this, see how each of them function, go back into the Republic, see how each of these functions in the dialogue, begin to see the nature of each one, and how each one then can be said to be understood in terms of its capacity to reflect upon its higher and bring you to the higher until finally you reach knowing, and through knowing, reach the intelligible, and in reaching the intelligible, reach the ultimate experience of man, which is an insight into the nature of the good itself. Ah, good. I wanted some time to talk. Uh, got my book here. Let me get a couple of lines for you. Now, he talks about a true number, and I am in book nine. This is all in book nine. I'm going to pull out. He says, what is true number? He says, true number is pertinent to the lives of men. If you can grasp the nature of men's lives, you can then transform it into a number. This is Pythagorean, all right? Now, let me see if I can help you with that, all right? Um, all right. uh, okay, um, <clears throat> the tyrant, now we're talking about it politically, but we also we can talk about it in terms of the state of mind of the tyrant. One PCW four five two lights are left on in your vehicle. Thank one piece. Thank you. Okay. No. One PCW four five two lights are on. Why don't you just kick the lights in? Okay. See, the tyrant is defined. Look here. Each of these people is defined both in their political role and in their psychological role and in terms of how they function and the pleasures and the, uh, and the pains that they experience, each one of them. All right? So the tyrant is next to the democratic man, who's next to the oligarchic. Now, he said, therefore, the tyrant is three removes from the oligarchy. But the oligarchic man, and an oligarchy, of course, is the state ruled principally by the wealthy, and therefore, 
Uh, next to the oligarchic going upward, of course, is the aristocratic and the kingly. Now, the oligarchic man is three times, three measures away from the true king. Therefore, the tyrant is three times three away. Or nine. Therefore, he's now going to use the number nine to represent the tyrant. Now, he's going to talk about the tyrant in respect to other qualities of the tyrant. And he is then going to place him along a scale which will then be able to reproduce a particular numerical value. You sum up all of those qualities and that will generate for you a particular number that represents the tyrant in all of his aspects and that's 729. Now, the way he does this I may have to go by memory. No. Ha! 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 Three times three, then, by the numerical measure, is the interval that separates the tyrant from true pleasure. That's three. Three times three, right? The, f the phantom of the tyrant's pleasure is then, by longitudinal measurement, a plain number. Another translation has it, according to the number of its magnitude, it would be a plain figure. See how he's weaving in, in a metaphoric use of the language from geometry into this field? Then you see, he then expresses the relationship by saying, and now you must square and cube it so that you finally get the distance that separates the tyrant from the true king. See, that's use of numbers in a totally different way, isn't it? Using figures, using cubing. So let me give you another one. So you say 729 is a plain figure? Yes. No, 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 no. That's a, it started with a plain figure. Then it, this is the, the cube, uh, the cubing it. Is the tyrant the plain figure? I didn't get the well, plain figure. You don't get what? What the plain figure referred to. This. That's a plain figure. Oh, uh, for the character of tyrant? Yeah. And when you put all of the qualities together, which <coughs> I can go for you, through you, with you, oh, it will end up to... 729. Then it's three dimensional. Right, three dimensional. Right. Okay. Now, what does this mean he's doing? What does this mean he's doing? I'm now in book 10. You see, first he has to define each one of these. That's what he means by measure. Because when you're measuring, you're defining the limits of something. That's the way they use that term. All right? Then, you then have to number it. And then you have to weigh its significance along any, anywhere along this. You see, once you've established the numbers, then you can weigh the relative value of each one of these as you proceed along the line as each one gets a different number numerical value. Therefore, you can make all your philosophical distinctions, but first you're measuring things that locates them precisely. Then you're going to establish symbolic, what they call the symbolic distance between them based upon some grasp of the essential elements of each. Translate that into a number, and then he calls it weighing. We just weighed the difference between the tyrant and the king in terms of true pleasures. Book 10. And have we not, have we not then measuring and numbering and weighing proved to be most 
proved to be the most gracious aids to prevent the domination in our soul of the apparently greater and less, the more or the heavier, and give control to that which has reckoned and numbered or even weighed. When he uses the word reckoned, that's reason. That's the word reason. Translator uses the idea of reckon. So therefore, he's going to exercise the reason by defining each one of these in such a way that he can then talk about their differences relative to one another, put them into a hierarchy, value, assign therefore certain numbers to the way in which they might differ, find compounds of them in respect to their pleasure, function, and use, and now he can talk about them very precisely, can't he? That's what he's doing. Now, and often when this has measured and declares and cert that certain things are larger or some are smaller and others equal, there is at that same time an appearance of the contrary which then can be challenged. Now let me give you a great quote. What's this all for? Through all of these studies then, here we go. Is a man then in all of this of one mind with himself? Because then if he can point out through this structure what you have to do to exercise the understanding and then see the way you're living and relate that against this structure the goal then is to have one mind with yourself. And I imagine you're thinking, one mind, is this one of the solutions to our gate problem of what after all is the nature of the one in itself? Mind itself. And again, I want to go back into the idea. Remember, we're talking about movements of numbers and speed and swiftness and slowness. Again, book 10. This is where he's talking about the law, the necessity of discussing the law and reason, reason and the law. The law, I suppose, declares that it is best to keep quiet as far as possible in calamity not to chafe and repine because we cannot know what is really good and evil in such things. And it advantages us nothing to take them hard and nothing in mortal life is really of great concern. And our grieving checks the very thing we need to come to our aid as quickly as possible in such cases. What's that? To deliberate about what has happened to us and as it were, in the fall of the dice to determine the movements of our affairs with reference to the numbers that turn up in the way that reason indicates we should then determine what is best. I wanted to introduce you to the arts of Plato, taken on a spiritual level, which is all of these come from Plato, all of these quotes come from Plato. And will that not engage you in a different way of looking at arithmetic, geometry, solid geometry, astronomy, harmony, and the dialectic? Thank you. Questions off the floor? We'll play some more. <laughs> well, I was thinking of going, I was going to do some more, and I thought okay. maybe I could. Uh, Johnny Yoga. Yeah. Well, how is this related to Johnny Yoga? What is Johnny Yoga? Geometry? Yoga? 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 Yoga?
certainly Plotinus, first of all. Plotinus has a brilliant essay on the one. You see, this idea of the one is absolutely central. And he talks about it in a very, very, if, if you like beautiful language and skillful use of metaphors and, and, and constructions, Plotinus is your person. Get the O'Brien translation, that's probably the best and cheapest, it's in paperback. And uh, it's very, 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 very profound. He talks about, the, um, and also on beauty, you need on the one and on beauty. Um, he talks about beauty. You see, he talks about beauty, same, same thing here. And he introduces it by saying, you know, like what is the experience of beauty? And he says, when it strikes you, it's immediate. You recognize it immediately. You welcome it as a friend. You're conjoined with it. The barriers that separate you from it are dropped. You can then enter it to it and appreciate it and become one with it. That's the that's way he talks. Very fine writer. Yeah. When he talks about the one, he takes it right from our everyday experience. He says, you know, anything that is anything has to be a one. When a group of people, uh, to give a recollection, uh, some years ago I went to a movie as a young man <coughs> and it was a German film and it was a story about the returning Germans who are coming up back from World War I and just a few of them were able to achieve uh, just some really heroic deeds together during the war and they came back and they're discharged the same number are now confronted with a mob of youths in the street far less than the people they fought now they don't have their unity anymore. And so the only way they got away is that one of them decides to throw an apple and call it in a grenade, and then that wakes everyone up and they scatter. But that's the point, you know, like, uh, what are these things that make a unitary? A symphony, what's a symphony? Just a group of people with some strings on a piece of board. And then suddenly with skill and magic, they bring about something and transform it into some symphonic masterpiece. So that's, that's unity. See, higher degrees of unity brings about a higher degree of oneness. So what would happen to the soul of man if the soul of man could be brought into a unity? Correspondingly, would one expect some greater experiences? And that's what Plotinus does. So I, I, would, I would go into Plotinus. Um, and this Plato Symposium, especially Socrates' speech in the Symposium, Um, did, did you skip over kinship or was that somewhere in between? No, 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 I hope not. Uh, kinship and community, actually. Um, okay, so that is between harmony and dialectic, is there an actual study called kinship? No, no. That's where he's making the point that each of these studies must be engaged in until one is able to then bring all of them together into a community and kinship. All right, so therefore you have to find some basis of making that, dis that distinction. But it's a process you have to go through. And that means what you're going to be doing, by the way, is you're going to be doing this with reason. That's going to give you a way of seeing their kinship and their community, one with the other. So you have to go back into each one, as we did a moment ago, pull out what he's describing in each, and you'll see their kinship, because we stressed, did we not, the very idea of number and numbering? That's its kinship, see? because all numbering is the same. Yes, please. 729 reduces to 9. Is there Oh, I'll give you. I'll give it. Oh, I'm glad you asked. I, I like to read that section. Um, uh, of course, you see that nine times nine is eighty-one, and when you nine that, what do you get? 
729. So that's the multiple, right? But um, Mm, book nine. Come on, book nine. The tyrant, I believe, we found at the third remove from the oligarch, for the democratic came between. Yes. And would he not also dwell with a phantom of pleasure in respect of reality, three stages removed from that other, if all that we have said is true? Yeah. And the oligarch in turn is the third remove from the royal man, if we assume the identity of the aristocrat and the king. Yep, third. Three times three then, by numerical measure, is the interval that separates the tyrant from true pleasure. The phantom of the tyrant's pleasure is then by longitudinal measurement, a plain figure. Quite so. Then by squaring and cubing it, it is clear what the interval of this separation becomes. It's by squaring and cubing that the interval between the two establishes their distance, one from the other. And therefore it's said then that the king the true king, philosopher king, then experiences 729 times more fully and completely pleasure than the tyrant. And conversely, of course, 729 is worse. Um, the one part that he has, you see, is that the three parts of the soul, this is the gain-loving, All right. Um, um, what he calls the goal, forcing after goals, right? And um, sometimes this is called desire, the spirited element, and the rational. He said the real goal for man is not to be at war against himself, but to bring to whatever you're doing, if you're pursuing pleasure, is that you want the rational part of the soul to bring with it the other two into a unity. And therefore, the soul has to judge <clears throat> on its highest level whether what it's doing in its pursuit of pleasure is rational, consistent with whatever it is that is bringing the person together. Right? In that case then, the spirited element and the desire element can form into a unity and under that condition the person is experiencing most fully all parts of the soul simultaneously in one pleasure. That's a kingly pleasure. He says now, he wants to now, he's going to measure this. This is the way he measures it. He said, if we want to judge this then, he says, would you not agree everyone has this open to them, the desiring part, seeking gain in a variety of ways. Right? So all. But some people go on to pursue in a spirited way their goals. Success, things like that. Right? So some. And some are after the goals such as we've established, few. He says, but however, those few have experienced all three. But the lowest level has only experienced itself 
and can't participate in the second or the third, or doesn't. The second, of course, can experience both, and therefore can judge both. Since one judges out of one's experience when one makes rational statements about one's experience. Therefore, there's only one person here who has full experience of all three and can judge, therefore, the rel relationship between each and the relative strength of each of the pleasures experienced by the soul of man. <coughs> so, so, that's measuring, making distinctions. Now he takes the same structure and he's going to push it on another level, right? One, two, three. Say so one, two, three. He's going to say that there is someone who designs there's <clears throat> uh, designs and uses. There's someone who makes what is used. And there is someone who can copy an image of what is used. So he uses the example, he uses several examples. One is the example of the, a bit fit for a horse. He said the craftsman who makes it is under obligation to follow the design of someone who uses it, who can improve on its use. And therefore, the maker of the craftsman must follow the suggestions and the advice of the person who uses it because they can point out what needs to be strengthened or weakened and therefore that person therefore must order the craftsman. However, there can be a person who then may paint a copy of what it is the craftsman does and he creates an image of what is used. But it's not true. He creates an image of the appearance of what is used. Right. When, if I'm a painter and I'm painting that chair, I'm not going to make a, a copy of an image of that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to make a copy of an image of the way it appears to me from this particular viewpoint and you can look at that from a variety of viewpoints and get different appearances of that same object if the object doesn't change for all the appearances that it has. All right, now, therefore we have another hierarchy, don't we? One, two, three. Now he's going to say that the tyrant, the tyrant is really someone who is an imitator. He really imitates a ruler, but he really isn't. He's really a thug who holds an office, and he's really a robber who holds office, and he really doesn't even deserve the title of tyrant because that suggests a relationship to a legitimate state. He said, therefore, he's really just someone who's copying and imitating what a ruler might do and be, but he's not even that. He's only given an image of an appearance of a ruler. Ah, if that's true then, all right, well, where did he get that appearance? He must have gotten that appearance. Well, someone must have been around so that he could imitate him. But wait a minute. That imitation, does the person who makes and appears the way in which the ruler appears, does he really know what a ruler is? Now he says, okay, next up, next up. He says, look here. This is also the level of imitation. Now, the tyrant is an imitation, and so were all the poets. And anyone who wants to convince you of anything, they have to imitate someone as if they know, and appear as if they know if they're going to try to persuade you about the truth of something. When they don't know it, they have to give the appearance, don't they? Therefore, he says, you know, what's interesting, therefore, is that um, imitation lies at the heart of all tyrants. And anyone who teaches anyone to imitate another is setting up the conditions for a people to appear and to convince others. But then he says, look here, let's look at the two types of people that can be imitated. He said, first of all, he said, if you want someone to be imit imitate someone, it's best to pick someone who's unstable. 
who goes through violent extremes because they're easier to imitate than someone who has a sound mind and doesn't show extremes in his behavior or his conduct and therefore looks quite cool to everyone. Worst person to imitate. Therefore, the only people who can be imitated are who themselves move back and forth in a real swift movement back and forth through all the forms that they take on. Uh-oh. Real swiftness? That's the way he describes these figures. He was, he was going to pick up that language we talked about before, real swiftness and real slowness. And then he changes it and he says, but the real motion to watch, the real movement to watch that has real speed is the person who can move from all of these to this. That's real speed. The psychic development, the spiritual development of man. And that's what we really should study. So that's the way he plays. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Did geometry then study the virtues? Uh, um, I don't think so. <clears throat> what would lead you to that? Well, it says it's, it's the study of, it's the knowledge of, of real beings. Yes. And uh, it seems to be building on the way you've laid it out is that the true number and the plain figures are representations of different kinds of lives and their relations. True. And the pursuit true. Of it. And it's all based on true. geometry. And for Plato, the, the true beings are the, vir the different virtues. But if not, then I, I'm, I guess I'm wondering what is. Like you gave a clear example of, of how to do arithmetic. What would be a, a clear example of how to do geometry? Apprehension of the idea of the good. Yeah, but I thought the whole point of geometry is to get you to apprehend the idea of the good. Uh, through contemplation of the one and the idea of the good. So it's the contemplation so of the idea of the good? Sure. Uh, I think the idea you're bringing in is a good one, which is usually in other dialogues he stresses the need for excellence, moral excellence. Mm -hmm. Right? But as we look at this, you see, this already assumes say, the, these are called the arts of the philosopher king. There's already a vast selection that's been taking place. And there are many other studies that precede this, especially music and gymnastics. But there's a screening, and only those people who survive this kind of screening are allowed to enter into the study. And they, the condition for that is they have to show excellence. Yeah. The condition for this. So they're studying themselves, really? Oh, sure. So the geometry then is studying that quality in, that you've achieved in yourself. Uh, no. No, that's the condition for the game. Right? It's a condition for the game. Because one, or watch, one already has to be able to talk about uh, temperance, justice, courage, wisdom. They already have to have some, some capability of exhibiting those virtues before they can be admitted into this last training, which is the spiritual training. Here's my puzzle here. It sounds to me that, um, like, calling this geometry is somewhat circular because the whole point of the arts is he's giving the presentation of the arts to say this is the way to get the philosopher to uh, the apprehension of the idea of the good, mm -hmm. and then you're saying geometry is the study is the 
contemplation of the idea of the good. Right. Is he just giving, well, how do you do it though? I thought geometry is supposed to get you there, but then you say geometry is, doing, is, is being there. No. Arithmetic gave you the object of contemplation. Yes. So geometry, geometry is, is doing what? It's telling you to pursue it, for this is its goal. See, the real question, all right, that I want you to, to take a look at is whether there is anything new in this study that isn't already in what was formerly called arithmetic. Is this a new study? Or does a continuation of contemplation? But then if it's not a new study, then why is he even bringing Pardon. it up in the first place? No, no, no. Look, watch. This converts the soul to the knowledge of being. Mm -hmm. Right? What does it do? It converts the soul to the knowledge of being. Right? It compels it to contemplate being. Now it's going to the idea of the good, to be able to perceive the blessed part of reality, to contemplate new thing essence, to be able to see that there's a part of reality which is continuously contemplating itself on every level. So why does he That's go? new. Okay, it's an activity. No, no, is I, that I, new? I, I see that. Good. I don't have no understanding whatsoever of why he's putting it in this language. I mean, wouldn't it have just been, he could have done this in one page and say, step one. Right? <laughs> Consider what is the one in itself, like like you said here. Step two, now that you're turning your soul to the uh, nature, nature of real being, contemplate um, the fact that it turns upon itself and the happiest part of it. Well, that's so what he's why, saying. Why bring, that's what he's saying. Why bring to the contemplate the essence. To take in these whole new sciences and studies. Because it's an analogy. You don't like analogies? Come on. I don't even see what's analogous about it. Do you see anything analogous between the state and the soul? Yes. Oh, good, 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 good. Would you agree that people who study these things formally in a state, therefore are prepared for, for more uh, knowledgeable positions in the state? If they went through each of these studies as they are? Oh, okay. Usually people who study arithmetic and these kinds of things are prepared for public office. Now, the question is, come on now, the question is, can we use this language to talk about the soul and its cultivation? I don't, I don't see why it helps. I don't see why it helps. Why this language of arithmetic and geometry and these different things help the, you know, the study? Okay. Help our understanding, you know, because well, it's an analogy it's supposed to make it clear, isn't it? It is clear. I don't find. I haven't found anything peculiar about it. No, no. Well, it clear. I think it obscures it. Pardon me. You may find it obscure, yes. but this is really simple. Would you agree? He's adding something here that he didn't have before. Yeah. Thank you. You asked how it differs. Did I point it out? Yes. Good. Good. Can we go through each one and see how it adds to it? Oh. I like what you did, Pierre. Wait, wait, wait. No, no, please, now. Yeah. Does it not also relate back to the allegory of the cave in the upper world? Do you have an interest in the allegory of the cave in the upper world? Oh, you're, you're, you're not. Um, uh, see, this is a vast allegory. Remember what we said. The very practice of deciphering this and using your mind to understand it is the very process of understanding. That's what he says. Okay. All right? And therefore, if you go through this, you have to puzzle your way through it, and you're exercising something called understanding. It's quite sophisticated. I agree with you. He could make it easy. Mm -hmm. Yes, he could. But then you wouldn't be exercising understanding and seeing all of these things. The only question that's worthwhile, I think, for this game is whether the cultivation of the understanding in this way benefits you or anybody who studied it. That's the real issue. In other words, the question you're asking is, is this, a, is this a significant way to pursue a spiritual life? Or is this the, uh, As a con people go to meditation, they go to Zen, they go to monasteries, they go to Christianity, they go to all kinds of religions. Each one has a spiritual path. This is Platonic. It requires understanding and the dialectic. And isn't it also, 
and, what? and an activity. And an activity. Isn't that what this level adds to? Yeah, it? yeah, yeah. And isn't it also in that I was thinking that in terms of the way he outlines image thinking, beliefs, understanding, and knowledge, that by using these kinds of concepts, he's showing he's moving from the appearance, which is the lower part, to the reality, and these have an appearance of knowledge each of these activities, but that isn't the true knowledge. So it, look, yeah. it looks like... Yeah. One's the appearance, one's the reality. So in some sense, he's... Yeah, that's true. He's bringing in everything that we relate to as knowledge. The geometry is an appearance of knowledge, is that true? Yeah, that's what he's saying. But let me return to the point. Would it be, would, could it be more simply stated directly without all of this analogical structure? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, but, it, but it, that's like giving you an answer, not, yeah. It is, it is or giving an answer. Not giving you that's right. Yeah. Yeah. See, obviously then you agree that if you were going to pull this out, you have to do some work. The question is whether or not the work is worthwhile. In what sense worthwhile? Does it bring the kind of benefit that he thinks it brings about? That is to say, is this or is this not a spiritual discipline that someone can take on for themselves and see whether or not it leads to those kinds of things which are described in the work? That's all. You mean he uses a light experience and you do it? Do it still right? No, it goes beyond light experience. It goes to the one which is beyond light. He owes the staff there. Yeah. No. So if you don't get a light experience, you just certainly know that you've got room. No, no. You get to the... No, see? The idea of light experience is the idea of the good. What's beyond the idea of the good and the king of all is called the good itself or the one. But if you were to do this, if you were to do this book really well... Mm -hmm. Then you'd at least get that. You'd at least get that. Yes, you would at least get the idea. Well, can you get the idea of the good without getting the good? In this book, it doesn't seem like you could. No, it's, it, it, perhaps. It's, it's rather this way. You see, Plato in the seventh book says there's a problem, and, and he reflects, and he says, no, there's a problem. And that is people who grasp this idea of the good, and they're bathed in this divine luminosity, they want to stay there, and they have no other function but to stay there. And he says, we aren't going to allow that in our system. He wants them to go beyond that to experience the nature of the good or the one itself. So yeah. See, there are many systems like Hinduism, like the Bhagavad Gita, who stop at the divine luminosity. That's the highest vision. Is there a notion in here of timing? Like a person will write in his practice and write in the practice and then see something. And, uh, it's a, yes, there's an age for each one of these, and it goes through a certain chronological period, so many years for this, so many years for that. But the real point is that one is finally understood, then one, then one contemplates. It's a contemplative art. By the way, would that mean it should be continuous? Like, what's the difference between meditation and contemplation? What's the difference between concentration and meditation? Right? Concentration, meditation and contemplation. Concentration is when I f f focus my mind on something. Meditation it doesn't change the object. It means that I have a continuous fixation on the object of attention. Continuous, does that remind you of something in there? Continuous, absorb, right? Once one, is a, once one is absorbed in the object of one's continuous meditation, that's contemplation. The object doesn't change as you proceed from concentration, meditation to contemplation. When you have attention, meditation, and contemplation in yoga, that's called a samyama. And if you can practice a, a samyama on anything, once you've mastered that three steps, he's saying, Okay, do it. On what? The nature of the one. Become one. The right is that's the goal. Become the one yourself. And he's going to lay out what he thinks is the procedure for such a unity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.